Let's get in shareholder perspective. Grant White, portfolio manager and investment advisor at IA Private Wealth. And Grant, you hold Fairfax for some, on behalf of some of your clients in their portfolio. Uh, talk to me about what this week has been like or more than week has been like. Of course, you're no stranger to when a short report hits, that sort of knee-jerk reaction. But then you have to go through the 72 pages in this case to figure out, is there merit here? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, actually. The last week, I mean, because as the day that the Muddy Waters uh, report came out, I had clients emailing me just asking people, what are we doing? And um, and frankly, you know, typically what I what I say in this situation is is just to hang tight. Let's review things and uh, no knee jerk reactions. And and thankfully, in this case, that was exactly what we did, because I think that um, if you had a knee jerk reaction to what was what was being reported, as in any case, when you get a, a short seller report, um, you're probably going to make the wrong decision overall. I mean, if you have a good long term thesis around the company you own and I think Fairfax uh, is a prime example of that. But if you have a good long-term thesis around uh, around the company, then um, then uh, then I think you should uh, stick to it and 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 until something uh, dramatically in the fundamentals changes. And we don't see anything like that with Fairfax Financial. I think it's a it's a, a still a great company with great leadership. And um, and uh, you know this most recent quarterly report I think shows that as well. Money Waters does have a reputation for for doing the work, famously exposing Sino Forest um, that, you know, most analysts at that time rated it a buy. So it was just kind of hanging out there as an option. He is calling into question some accounting practices and the value of certain parts of the portfolio with respect to Fairfax. The word fraud is not being used here the way that it was being used uh, with Sinoforce. So very different. But having said that, as an investor who looks at the financials and the value and the investments that they hold, are you comfortable with how Fairfax engages with uh, its accounting practices and disclosures? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, they raised some interesting points that obviously um, it, it's well within their right. And I mean, full disclosure, I'm not a huge fan of short sellers in the first place. I think that, you know, they uh, they tend to cherry pick things that they want to see and they can be quite destructive. Um, but in saying that, and that, that's that's just a comment overall, nothing against this report overall. But I, I think in saying that, they raised some good points that, you know, we were interested to see, you know, how the company responded to them. Um, but at, at the same time, there was nothing in there. I think that what they did was really cherry picked a few areas where they thought, oh, that this this could be a, a good thing to go after here. And and ultimately, they've kind of missed the forest for the trees. No pun intended with sound forest, but I think they missed the forest for the trees with Fairfax um, because there's so many good things that were going on. The word obviously weren't mentioned in this report as well. And, and you know, there's a lot to like about this company going forward. And and again, I think that the, you know, the company's reporting has shown that. And so uh, so it didn't raise any concerns, um, but we were interested to see how, how Prem Watson and, and the team there would respond to them. You're actually not the first person to use that uh, on my show, The Forest for the Trees. And that has been the point that others have made that are still bullish on Fairfax. And even if you were to take the report at face value, it doesn't actually uh, get to the heart of why Fairfax is doing so well right now. So maybe take us through that part of it. Why do you own it and how are they positioned? How do they get to all time highs in, in, in a pretty quick rally over the last year? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we really like about the business is that, you know, we're seeing continued growth in, in the areas that they're really strong in, but we're also seeing you know, a little bit more diversification away from, uh, you know, from the, the core holdings, the insurance uh, holdings, if you will, of the company as well. And so, um, you know, we, we really like the company because we're seeing growth in all three key areas that we like to see them in, in, in this case. And at the same time, we're looking at a business that uh, is adding more value and, and continuing to diversify, making it a much more comfortable core we're in our portfolio uh, going forward at the same time. I don't think that, you know, what we've seen in the last little while is, is um, gonna, it's going to continue on at that same kind of a pace, obviously. We're not expecting home runs all the time from a company like Fairfax, but, you know, we do like the fact that we can grow at a reasonable pace with it and, and be very comfortable in that holding uh, on a long-term basis. And nothing in this Muddy water report has done anything to shake that confidence uh, in it. I, again, I always like to hear Prem wants to talk about it. I, I mean, he does have a bit of an ego. Um, I, I, I thought his, his answer to the questions from Muddy Waters this morning were interesting, um, but they were very pointed and direct. And, and frankly, that's what we like to see out of him as well. So, uh, so it, I, overall, as a company, we like it for the long term still. And candid about one of the criticisms, which is that hitting their 15% growth rate uh, target, um, and while he acknowledged, Watsa did, that they'd fallen short of that near term, 
he was open about the fact that we're not hiding it. We've talked about it um, in, in annual letters. As a shareholder, how much does that fuss you? Do you feel like they, they are in a right position to start hitting that target? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you go through the entire history of the company, you know, that that uh, looking at their figures look a lot better. I mean, you know, we've gone through an, a period of time where, you know, interest rates were at all time lows for a long, long period of time. I mean, that wasn't the historical norm. And so um, and so as you go through that period, I mean, I think that has to be taken into consideration. Now, looking at the environment today where we've got much higher interest rates and we'll see how things go this year. But if we've got interest rates that remain somewhat higher than what we've experienced, so well, really since the financial crisis. Um, then I think that, uh, you know, the company has a, has a higher likelihood of hitting those figures and those hurdle rates. And um, and so, uh, you know, we expect that that should continue on. But in saying that, it hasn't been a concern for us uh, since uh, since buying. I mean, we bought the company probably about five or six years ago. And um, and it wasn't a problem for us then. And it doesn't mean it, it's not a problem for us going forward. And, and uh, in saying that, we like we think that they have a much better shot, a shot of hitting it going mm. forward. So before I let you go, I'd love to get your two cents on Air Canada. The stock is getting hit today, even as it boosted its forecast for profitability. I get the sense that there's some skepticism around their ability to grow profit while they've got high costs to contend with and maybe relying on a more robust airfare environment that might not be there if Canadians soften on their travel interests. Yeah, I mean, and again, full disclosure on this, I'm not a huge fan of airlines because there's too many things that get in the way of, of good profits, whether it's fuel costs or or you name it. And Air Canada is going through some of those, those challenges right now, um, you know, related to increased capacity and, and things like that. Um, you know, you see it as they, you know, they hit re they hit revenue targets, but they can't hit profits, and and so um, I, I think that the pathway forward for a company like Air Canada is. Uh, it's going to be challenged, and 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 you know there's competition certainly as you point out, and and so um, so is it going to be an easy win? No, I think the money is better. Uh, I think investors' money is better utilized in other places where you know we see an easier pathway to growth, and and um, and that's often what we're looking at it within the portfolio is is this the best allocation for our money uh, for for our clients' money, and and if there's better opportunities and easier pathways to growth, then I think that we should be looking to take those, and and frankly with a company like Air Canada, it's hard. For for me to get behind seeing it as an easy pathway uh, to growth uh, versus other areas. It's such a universally loved stock on Bay Street in terms of the um, sell side analysts that cover it. And a lot of them are pointing to, I'll just take National Bank, for example, are saying, look at the valuation. It's already pricing in a materially worse profit picture than even Air Canada forecast for 2024. So investors are going to be hearing that, getting those kind of notes in, in their inbox. What's the context around that? Well, I mean, I think from a pricing perspective, you could say that. But at the same time, uh, again, I'm I'm looking at it from a perspective of future growth, and 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 based on like pricing is one thing, but you know you have to look at what the company can potentially do going forward as well. And and so in an ideal world, those two things line up. In this case, I don't think they're lining up. I think that yeah, pricing is is all right. Um, if that's the only thing you cared about, you might be interested in this. But at the same time, I think that um, there's other companies out there that you can equal pricing opportunities and, and just by their better, much better growth rates out there. And and and, um, and like I said, I, I think that there's challenges facing companies like Air Canada that um, are hard to overlook if, if uh, from an easy win perspective. And, and uh, you know, if you want the best allocation for your money, then I'm not sure Air Canada fits the mold. It's it's a good company. Don't get me wrong. I think that the company operating in its space is solid. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I just see better opportunities in other places. 